Thakwa Nuna Jad Phuong, Manjan Man once said, people are all alike. But they're not all alike. But when you come right down to it, they are all alike. That was the teaching. And John Fuyang's comment was, you have to think about that for quite a bit to make sense of what he said. In other words, we have our differences, we have our own peculiar ways of making ourselves suffer and making the people around us suffer. But when you come right down to it, the basic principles of why we're suffering are all the same. We don't understand the cause of suffering. We don't understand what to do to put an end to suffering. Once we can come to that one understanding, what suffering is, what causes it, what we can do to put an end to it, we find that the ultimate solution is always the same for everybody. Now the Buddha did admit that there are various ways of conceiving the path, but there are a limited number of variations, and they all basically contain the same factors. Virtue, concentration, discernment, sorted out in different ways. And you look at the different, you look at different lists and the wings to awakening, and you see sometimes that the factors are listed in different orders. For instance, in the the path, wisdom comes first. Mindfulness and concentration come at the end. In the practice for awakening, mindfulness comes first, then you get wisdom, and then concentration comes at the end. In the five strengths, mindfulness comes before concentration, and wisdom comes at the end. And so the different listing relates to the fact that we do have different propensities and each of us has different strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes our strengths and weaknesses change over time. But the basic elements are all the same. What this means is the path is not a matter of preference. There's not the easy path for people who like easy paths or the hard path for people who like hard paths. It is up to us whether we want to give ourselves over to the path completely or take a more casual approach. But the more casual approach also means that it's going to take a lot longer. And there are a lot of pitfalls along the way. This is a good thing to think about when you're getting interested in something outside that's going to pull you away from the path. You want to ask yourself, how long am I going to be pulled away here? And you don't really know. Life is uncertain. Death and rebirth are very uncertain. You have to remind yourself that the opportunity you have to practice now is a precious opportunity. It's something special, and it should be treated as something special. And as to whether you like the path or don't like the path, you may have noticed that the Buddha was not the sort of teacher that was concerned with how popular his teachings were going to be. His one concern was that his teachings would get results. That was his main fear when the prospect of teaching came to him, that he might put a lot of effort into it and nobody would benefit. 
and is convinced, though, that there were people who would benefit, he went ahead and taught. And there was some teaching. It wasn't that he needed to teach and felt compelled to teach. There's something really special right there. Most teachers have a message and they just can't wait to get it to other people, as if somehow getting other people to believe in the message too confirms its truth. The Buddha had already seen the truth of his teachings. His attainment was already complete. But he had the compassion to want to help. At the same time, he realized that his authority as a teacher was something that only he knew. As the Jamahabu once said, if the Buddha could have taken out his attainment and showed it to people, there wouldn't be anybody who wouldn't want it. Everybody would want it. But he couldn't take it out. At the same time, he was not in a position of authority where he could tell people what to do. He didn't claim to be a god. He didn't claim to be their creator. And as a result, he couldn't be their lawgiver. He couldn't force them. He offered his teaching as, as an opportunity for them, as a gift. You read in a lot of postmodern theory about how every act of speech is, a, is an attempt at gaining power over others. But that wasn't the Buddha's case. He had already attained when he needed to attain, what he wanted to attain. And so he offered his teachings for anyone who was willing to take them, offer them as a gift. If they didn't take them, as he said, he would not let his mind get upset. He would maintain mindfulness as always. But what he had found was the truth, and he was confident in the power of that truth, the efficacy of that truth. It, was going to, it would work. And so he offered it for people's consideration. Not with the idea that well, this might work for you, or maybe something else might work for you, and I don't really know. That's not his attitude at all. He said, this is what works. It was up for other people to accept it or not. But he was confident enough in the truth that if people would accept it and put it into practice, it would work for them, regardless of what their background was. regardless of race or nationality. It wasn't the case there was one truth for Indians and another truth for Chinese and another truth for, for Thais. The truth was the same wherever you go. And as for people who wanted a different truth, he left them to their own devices. There are times out of compassion when he would try to be persuasive. It wasn't that he was totally indifferent to whether his teaching would work or not. He saw that some people really were suffering but had the potential, whether they knew it or not. To respond to his teaching. And so he would use various techniques. It's interesting to note that when the Buddha was arguing with people, people would actually come to argue with him in the most cases. When they would come and pick a fight, his main consideration was, is this person really serious about learning the truth? If the person just wanted to score a few points, the Buddha would refuse to talk to him, which meant that if he did engage the person in an argument, it was a sign of respect. This person wants the truth. And the techniques he would use in 
debating with the other person were the same techniques he would use when he was trying to explain something to someone who was having trouble understanding. That was his basic attitude. This person just doesn't understand. And he would draw analogies and give examples to help that person see what the Buddha meant and how reasonable it was, and to instill in that person a desire to try the practice. So he knew he couldn't force his teachings on people. He was not in a position where he could force anything on anybody. But he did know that he had something good to offer, something that, if other people accepted it, would put an end to their suffering. And so as we look at his dharma and think about practicing it and sit here trying to practice it, we should keep that thought in mind. We're here because we want to be here. We're here voluntarily. And most of us come here with a divided will. Part of us wants to be here and part of us wants to be off someplace else. Part of us says, I'd like faster results, I'd like this, I'd like that to be changed, I'd like this to be changed. But you can remind yourself, you've been changing things for a long time, trying to bend the world to your will. So how about trying something new, something that might actually get results, bending your will to the Dharma? After all, the Buddha himself did not invent the Dharma. He simply points it out. This is something he discovered. It wasn't something he thought of because he liked the idea. But he tried all different kinds of ways of trying to find an end to suffering. Going down many dead-end roads. So when he found what really worked, it wasn't just an individual discovery. It was something as he learned that as he taught it to other people, this works for other people as well. This is why he said that the, one of the factors that leads to awakening is practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, which means several things. One is basically you try to adjust yourself to fit into the Dharma rather than the other way around. And also that you practice for dispassion. And what do we have passion for? We have passion for our preferences. So you're trying to put your preferences aside so you can see what works. I mean, your ultimate preference, of course, is you want to see the end of suffering. That particular preference the Buddha does not have you put aside. But everything else that would get in the way of that, he says, just let it rest for the time being. Give this a try. Give it a serious try. Not grim, but dedicated, consistent, using your ingenuity to overcome obstacles. And the more you practice, the more you discover that we really are all alike, that we have differences in our strengths and weaknesses and our propensities. I noticed with the John Furong when he was teaching concentration, it was like people were starting out in different spots in a field, and he was trying to lead them all to one spot, which meant that for some people he had to tell them to go north, and other people had to be told to go south, east, west, depending on where they were starting out. But ultimately, they would all come to the same spot, the spot where the mind is still, the breath is still, your awareness fills the body. And getting there may have required all kinds of ups and downs, not just east, west, north, and south, but 
Some people had problems with visions, other people had problems with the different elements in their body, out of balance. All kinds of issues would come up as they're trying to get to this one spot. But once they got to this one spot, the path was pretty much the same for everybody. Everything would fall right in line. So the fact that we're starting off at different points in the field, that's where we're different. Well, the ultimate truth that liberation is gained through not clinging. And not clinging is most effective when you train the mind to be still. So that its attachments grow fewer and fewer, and you have just that one attachment left. The attachment to the stillness and clarity of your mind when it's in concentration. And then when everything is ready, you can cut that attachment, and you're free. Because prior to that point, if you have lots of different attachments, when you try to cut one, your mind immediately goes running to another. You cut that one, it goes running off to another. When you learn how to narrow down your attachments, so that there are no alternatives. Once you cut that final attachment, there's no other place the mind is going to go except to freedom. That's a technique that works for everybody. Whether you like it or not, there it is. And whether other people like it or not, there it is as well. And once you've attained that point, you don't need other people's approval to confirm it. You feel compassion for them, you'd like to share this knowledge with them. But if they don't want it, you just have to say, well, that's it's up to them. Maybe somebody else is their teacher. Maybe somebody else can show them the way. And that makes life easier for everybody, for all concerned. 